and welcome back to another session of MEG2 British drama and uh, as we get started uh this is our ninth session and uh, we just have one more to go and so sad eh? we are coming to a uh, an end a happy or the other way around an end that is inevitable to any 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 discourse so we'll get started with uh yeah I, unlike what i told you yesterday because i received quite a few mails uh asking me about whether i could postpone the annotation session for tomorrow because a couple of you could not attend the class today and there were a few who cannot uh complete your annotations by today uh i thought okay why not i mean the classes are eventually for you only so just in case you are not ready for it then i think i should be giving you that additional day so that's fine so the point i'm trying to make is today we'll as a as a as a switch of plans what we'll do is we'll quickly try to deal with samuel beckett and his waiting for god uh and i've been uh fortunately or unfortunately i've been hands full at work and uh, uh all i can do because of this uh, last minute reversal is that i can kind of quote my memory and try to perform in front of you a few things and that's where performativity would suffer as well so uh, i apologize for not going for a hamlet redo because um, it requires some sort of a preparation to perform in front of you but all i can do is maybe i can try to be a little bit more active and i can try to give you an overview of a lot of things today we have two hours i'm not going to deal with beckett alone but i'm also going to deal with the evolution of drama last part and uh, this would help you immensely in terms of your future life and uh, that's what my intention is we'll come to go though hopefully by 6:30 as usual but then at least by then i'd like to take this to a particular point from where we can take it along all right so maybe let's try to get started i can see there are close to 45 people which is good to see which is really great to see and uh, i'd like to get started on that note speaking about theater we were discussing a few classes ago the sort of evolution that the theater has undergone we saw a couple of videos wherein what happens after william shakespeare's theater what happens in the post restoration era and so on and on and on if you remember my initial classes we discussed about the evolution of drama from the classical period we discussed the peculiarities of the greek stage then we discussed how it evolved into the renaissance theater we discussed what all changes the stage as a whole underwent as in the drop curtain being introduced female actresses coming through music coming in so we discussed a lot of changes the chorus almost diminishing or becoming extinct so we discussed all these uh, possibilities over the uh, last few classes so today i'm going to specifically speak about well 20th century drama that is say for instance 1900 or 1901 to thereafter and uh, to be more precise i'll be speaking about post 1940s or 1950s but nonetheless we are going to discuss 20th century drama to get started before we no i think yeah i just need to get started with the changes all right so speaking about theater you may remember if you all right so today we'll discuss about 20th century drama the evolution to its fag end to the updated end and today uh, the focus that i have for you is about we have to get until uh, samuel beckett's waiting for godo but before we do that speaking about the beginning of 20th century before that i would again like to remind you that if you go through william shakespeare's plays or most of the plays that's initially prescribed for you you would see that these plays are all five act plays five act plays slowly there is an evolution taking place maybe because people do not have time for it or maybe because uh, playwrights are too dull to write five acts they are not skilled enough probably or whatever it is uh, by the time you come to the 18th and 19th century you can see that the uh, structure of the play has also changed for example if i remember correctly oscar wilde's play importance of being the importance of being earnest 
was a four act play initially later converted into a three act play so guys i was trying to say that uh the word yeah so initially uh, oscar wilde's the importance of being earnest was a four act play which later was cut short into a three act play if i remember correctly it could be the other way around as well but nonetheless uh, so uh, if you look at uh, look back in anger which we'll be dealing with tomorrow by john osborne it's a three act play only three acts mind you unlike five acts by william shakespeare which are long so uh, 20th century drama underwent a lot of changes which also includes structural changes 20th century saw a lot of what do you call theatrical differences i'll get started with the elementary ones first and then i'll take you to the next level i'll play a video for you that will give you details about a movement called expressionism and uh, expressionism is a term that's generally associated with a playwright called eugene o'neil from america so while we speak about expressionism i'm quickly taking you over there and then we'll come back and uh, we'll quickly rush through the evolution and quickly move on to the theater of the absurd greetings i'm mike rugnetta this is crash course theater and today we'll explore another controversial 20th century movement this one revolted against the confining form of realism in favor of a form that more adequately portrayed the experience of the human soul in the midst of an increasingly violent and mechanistic world ladies gentlemen sentient skulls i give you expressionism we'll look at its origin its literature its stage craft and its impact on american modernism can we get like a little bit more light in here Expressionism is a less often talked about 20th century-ism because it doesn't really have a principal advocate or even a manifesto. Yorick, you wanna work something up? The term was first used in 1901 to describe new trends in visual art. Basically, what makes Monet's water lilies different from Van Gogh's sunflowers? Well, Monet's water lilies, very impressionistic, are an attempt to capture the feel of a moment through the depiction of an object. We're very focused on light and place, not portrayals of moments, but impressions of them, you might say. Van Gogh's sunflowers are one important precursor to expressionism, where artists attempted to capture their own emotional experience and internal state rather than objects or situations. Van Gogh wasn't an expressionist, but he was a huge influence on them. Following his work, the expression of emotional experience in the visual arts became increasingly abstract because no amount of realism can ever capture the truth of the modern world and its horrifying lived experience. A lot of impressionistic theater, mostly painting and music, but when expressionism started as a reaction to impressionism, it impacted theater in a big way. Expressionists were interested in bringing about a new, better, braver world but most of their plays were dark and the new world never arrives because everyone is busy being murdered as movements go expressionism was more serious than dada and less dreamy than surrealism it was actually not that different from symbolism but with darker lighting more screaming and way more emotion if symbolism was about trying to determine a universal truth expressionism concerned itself with one artist's weird individual perspective expressionism's radical focus on the self made it a bit like romanticism. But expressionism also had an urban focus. No mountaintops, no crags, and the focus wasn't really on character, but on ideas and feelings. Most of the characters were just archetypes. The term expressionism shows up in theater just before World War I, but it definitely has theatrical precursors, like Georg Buchner's Wojciech, a savage, fragmentary play based on an actual murder. This one was left incomplete at the time of Buchner's early death from typhus in 1837. And what is it with these playwrights and early death? The play is based on Johann Christian Wojciech, a schizophrenic soldier who murdered his common law wife. The play reflects Wojciech's chaotic mind. No one knows what order the scenes can go in, which makes them even more hallucinatory and fun to rearrange. Try it at your next nerdy theater party. 
or don't. Another proto-expressionist play is Frank Wiedekind's 1891 Spring Awakening, which many of you will know from the Broadway musical version. It's a story of adolescent pain and desire and how the old generation harms the younger one. Wiedekind's version is much more violent and less naturalistic, full of mysterious and creepy symbols and figures, like the masked man who appears in the final graveyard scene. And there's also a definite whiff of expressionism in some of August Strindberg's late plays, like To Damascus. In a 1907 essay, Truth in Error, Strindberg offers an early definition of expressionism. The world is a reflection of your interior state and of the interior states of others. The movement really got going in Germany after World War I. Some people argue that Oskar Kokoschka's Murderer, The Hope of Women, first performed in 1909, is the first full-on expressionist play, while other people argue that it's Walter Hassenklever's Der Sun, or The Sun, performed in 1916. Hassenklever describes Der Sun as the expression of a soul swollen with tragedy. I'm going to describe it as an intergenerational conflict. The greatest German playwright that expressionism produced is probably Georg Kaiser. His Gas trilogy, The Choral, Gas, and Gas II, explicitly connects the expressionist worldview to the devastations of the First World War, a war that Kaiser didn't actually serve in. He had a nervous condition. The other German expressionist to know is Ernst Toller, a playwright who was also president of the Bavarian Soviet Republic for a red-hot second. Toller wrote, Humanity seeks in art the solution of various miseries and conflicts. Art is betrayed when the terrible story of humanity is misinterpreted in insignificant niceties. Toller's 1927 play, Hoopla, We're Alive, is about a man who spends eight years in an insane asylum. When he leaves, he discovers a politically transformed world that's just as chaotic as a madhouse. Erwin Piscator, a guy we'll meet when we discuss epic theater, directed the Berlin premiere in 1927. He used sophisticated projection design that included newsreels from the Russian Revolution to give the play a more explicitly political feel. A new theater also required a new style of acting. Remember all that cool stuff about mumbling and turning your back on the audience? Expressionism was not into it. Actors were encouraged to create mechanical shapes with their bodies and to use exaggerated gestures and declamatory modes of speaking or screaming. Screaming, I say. As the Czech playwright Paul Kornfeld wrote, let him dare to stretch his arms out wide and with a sense of soaring speak as he has never spoken in life. In short, let him be not ashamed of the fact that he is acting. Let him not deny the theater to try to feign Reality. Ugh, reality. Have you seen reality? Why bother? Expressionism also helped continue a revolution in set design that favored abstraction and symbolism over realism. This revolution, like a lot of revolutions, started earlier with the game-changing designs of Adolf Appia and Edward Gordon Craig. Appia is maybe best known as a lighting designer. He thought that lights, scenery, costumes, and the actors' bodies should be merged into a seamless whole, the mise-en-scene. Some of his most influential designs were for Wagner's operas in the 1880s and 1890s. His sets were simple, sometimes sinister assemblages of wide, shallow steps and narrow columns. The sets were stark and uncluttered, the better to emphasize the bodies of the actors and shifts in lighting. Gordon Craig wasn't a big fan of actors. He preferred designs in which the actors were strictly subordinate. He pioneered the use of mobile screens as a design element, using them in famous Moscow art theater productions of Hamlet. His sets often had an emotive quality, and he actually got mad when he thought that the actors were tainting them with their own emotions. Also, he hung the lights above the stage for the first time. Robert Edmund Jones was another leading expressionist designer. He adopted Gordon Craig's idea of a continuous mise-en-scene, creating bold and simple stage spaces for playwrights, especially for Eugene O'Neill and his theater company, the Provincetown Players. Jones thought that since movies have a lock on realism, theater should strive for something stranger, more abstract, and more beautiful. The United States was late to a lot of cultural things, and the theatrical avant-garde was one of them. But America went for expressionism 
in a big way. Something about the movement's concern with industrialization really spoke to American writers. Confronted with so many new technologies, they saw increasing mechanization as soul killing, a kind of death in life. And they created plays about people who rage against the machine, literally but also unsuccessfully. One of the first major expressionist works in the US was Eugene O'Neill's 1922 play, The Hairy Ape, a fragmented story of dehumanization. We're saving O'Neill for our episode on American moderns though, so you're gonna have to wait for that one. Instead, we'll take a closer look at American expressionism's high watermark, Sophie Treadwell's 1928 play, Machinal, based on an actual murder case that featured Ruth Snyder, the first woman to die in the electric chair because technology. Take it away, Thought Bubble. The play is divided into nine fragmentary scenes. First, a young woman shows up late to her secretarial job at the George H. Jones Company because she had a panic attack on the subway. The woman's mother tries to get her to eat potatoes, while the girl reveals that George H. Jones himself has proposed marriage. Her mother tells her to marry him, even though the woman likes him about as much as she likes potatoes. The young woman is then on her honeymoon, actively repulsed by her husband's sexual advances. The woman is in the maternity ward. She hasn't bonded with her baby, and she's deep in what we'd now call postpartum depression. She refuses to eat, rejecting the advice of the paternalistic doctors. A visit from her husband only makes things worse. She goes out dancing with a girlfriend and meets a man, Roe, who describes how he escaped from bandits in Mexico. The woman is like, oh wow, freedom. She's also like, hey, someone who doesn't repulse me. She slept with Roe, but it's clear that she wants more from the affair than he does. She's home with her husband. Her disgust and sense of confinement have only grown. The woman is on trial for her husband's murder. After Roe sends a damning letter supporting the prosecution, the woman confesses to the killing. The judge asks, why? To be free, she says. She's brought to the electric chair while a priest harangues her with passages from the Bible. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Treadwell wrote that she wanted to reach into spectators still secret places and show them their own entrapment in an increasingly industrialized world. She suggested an elaborate lighting design and soundscape, including typing, telephones, the subway, to enhance the oppressive qualities of modern, mechanized life that the woman tries unsuccessfully to break away from. Expressionism is deeply critical of mechanism and its effects on the human soul. But next time, we're gonna meet some movements that are into it. We're going to explore Futurism, a fun Italian movement that was also uh, full of fascists and uncomfortably pro-war. And we're also going to look at Constructivism, a Russian movement that wanted to transform the actor into a beautiful machine. Until next time, wait, do avant-garde theaters even have curtains? Okay, yes, sometimes. All right, so curtain, but a weird one. Crash Course Theater is produced in... All right, so let's continue from that. On a very brief note, in another five or 10 minutes, I'd like to move on to theater of the episode. So before I attempt to do that, there were at least a few of you, three to five, I'm not going to name them, who joined after 5.40. And I think I've told you immense time that this is not something that's acceptable. So LKG okay. PG class. Yeah, so we were, we were trying to discuss about the uh, 20th century drama and uh, I showed you a video on expressionism because I wanted you to be familiar with that term. So what exactly is expressionism? Expressionism in simple terms, if I can again give you another hint to MEG um, 3. Uh, expressionism is to drama what stream of consciousness is to know it. A classic example that this video missed out is uh, Eugene O'Neill's play called Emperor Johns, J-O-N-E-S. Again, a nine scene play. The first and the last scene happens in real. The remaining seven is from the mind of Emperor Johns, the protagonist. So reflecting the deep intricacies of our human soul is what the expressionists tried to explore. In order to achieve that, they resorted to various methods which also included music. For example, in Emperor John's, there is this extensive use of uh, drums and lighting and so on. And uh, another theatrical form that I'd like to talk to you about at this point of time 
is called the one act play as as we began our session today i talked to you about the five act plays so from five act play the evolution somewhat gets to a, a conclusion not that thereafter there was no other two act or three act plays but then it somewhat comes down to a one act play and speaking about one act plays you could see a lot of proponents of the same including eugene o'neil tennessee williams another american playwright and then you also have someone like w w jacobs william wycart jacobs who has written a wonderful one act play like um monkey's paw just in case you haven't seen that uh, p a w monkey's paw is a play that you should go back and have a look at so what necessitated this shrinking it's very simple common place you look at the evolution of cricket as a sports game for instance cricket began as a five day test match game or contest over the period of years people started losing interest in spending five days in watching a match so then during the 1990s of course it was colorless as well so uh, during the 1990s there emerged new color jerseys television broadcasting rights then there was this 50 50 over format and by say 2008 or something uh, people were fed up with 50 50 as well we have to spend a whole day especially if we go to work then come you know to take leave to watch a match was something that people were not approving of so because of that 2020 emerged and now we even have 10 10 leagues in the arab or united uh, arab emirates so people don't have time that's point number 1 and theater as an art form especially in america was threatened by the development of another genre ningalke evadu undo nokkatte enda irikkum naadagathine bheeshani ayu uyarnu vanna mattoru meghala cinema cinema very good point on cinema emerged as a very popular medium across the world and unlike theater cinema contained a lot of unique features pinid lora mulve ennu parayna critic voyerism enna perittu vilikkunna enda vaay notam nulla indalle olinu notam nulla ind english aa voyerism enna perittu vilikkunna onnu cinema sadhyamaakki yeah in cinema you can have close ups of an actor or an actress if you want you can uh, there is this popular uh, or you know controversial statement made, made by g venu cameraman who used to say that palaya kala director maar okke streegalde ivadnu melpotekku zoom cheyde camera vekkullar so we all know what is the purpose behind that so ee reel camera tended to be voyeuristic so unlike a theater where you have a stage and there are people watching from varied spaces for example if somebody is on the back then he won't be having the same look of the actor like somebody sitting in the front row or a side row yeah so uh, cinema breaks such barriers cinema also gave a lot more mobility to scenery yeah maybe you could really speak from a uh, classroom than putting a set of a class so cinema threw open a wide range of po- possibilities there were music there were laughter there were a lot of things that came aside uh, with movies initially it was black and white so with cinema gaining currency or popularity theater started getting threatened and mind you three act or four acts were not something that people would appreciate of especially when people like charlie chaplin started making uh, movies of say 30 minutes to 1 hour length so 30 minute or manikur la or kadai ulla or modern times akka pole or cinema kandu tarangan pattuvengil why waste time on a three act play is what people started beginning i mean started thinking so in order to cope up with this shift in popularity theater started drawing immensely from the techniques of cinema that's how expressionism emerged that's how tennessee williams theater called memory theater or memory play you can google this later memory play emerged i have also talked to you about expressionism i have already given you that statement that something that only i can say expressionism is to theater what stream of consciousness is to know it and by the way endan stream of consciousness mg3 padichu namu edike double check cheyrotte we are running out of time but still what is stream of consciousness for example people like virginia wool for james joyce uh, dorothy richardson i guess she is the one to coin that term initially yeah these people wrote novels which were about the minds of characters 
So for example, Virginia Woolf in her novel uh, will have say hundreds of pages detailing what happens in two or three days. Then within the next three pages, twenty years would be over. Yeah. So that's quite strange. But then if you love that, maybe you would love that. And as a Malayali, I can proudly say that one of the best. stream of consciousness novels to be ever written was neither written by virginia wolf nor james joyce you have both of these people to study but then it was written by a malayalam writer any guesses arundhati roy alla madhavi kutti alla <laughs> sorry a malayalam writer who still alive somebody who is also known for his familial novels in general empty ano of course empty vasudevan nair eda novel nu parayavo it also has an english translation randamura no alla oru rap paattu garande shabdam kekumbol ninde hrudayam thagarnu povirudhu vimile or if that's not enough maranam rangabodham illatha komaliya that's not said by shakespeare that's said by empty maranam rangabodham illatha komaliya eda manny manny very good it is translated into english as the mist by empty himself though the mist is not that accurate but manny by uh, empty was devan nair is one of the best stream of consciousness novel that you would ever come across and malayalam bodha dhara no stream of consciousness inde malayalam word is bodha dhara novel character inde manasil ullathu reveal cheyina novel so mt's manny is one such prime classic example just in case you haven't read it that's one of the smallest novels ever written by mt we speak about ts eliot writing a thousand lines and uh, esra pound cutting it into 434 or 38 yeah uh here mt himself wanted to write one of the most crispier novels and uh, uh, he uh, i think it's barely 60 or 70 pages long tale of a school teacher and again i would suggest that novel to you because you have to learn a novel of a similar kind in mg3 called prime of miss jean brody no vimala is not like jean brody vimala is someone who's ready to wait but at the same time how should a teacher be with her students is something that happens in this in this novel as well and coincidentally because we are discussing waiting for godo a little while later manya also deals with the theme of waiting vimala is waiting for her lover who had deserted her a kaathirippinde oru oru nossana a novel just in case you haven't read it you should go back and have a look at it it's a wonderful novel okay so coming back to uh, british theater so one act plays emerged and people like tennessee williams Uh, pioneered it so did uh, w w jacobs and so on so you can go back and have a look at this simply type one act plays in wikipedia and it will give you one act plays of tennyson wikipedia and it will give you a uh, wagons full of cotton and other other stories so that has i think 54 plays or something in which in one of which you have the american novelist b uh, h lawrence coming in as a character with his wife isn't that interesting ഡേച്ച് ലോറൻസും അയാളുടെ ഭാര്യയും ഒരു ഒരു വണാക് പ്ലേയിൽ കഥാപാത്രമായി വരുന്നുണ്ട് ടെന്നസി വില്യംസ് ആൻഡ് ടെന്നസി വില്യംസ് എക്സ്പെരിമെന്റഡ് വൈഡ്ലി ബിക്കോസ് വി ഡോണ്ട് ഹാവ് ടൈം എം നോട്ട് ഗോയിങ് ടു ദറ്റ് മെമ്മറി പ്ലേ കോൺസെപ്റ്റ് ഐ വിൽ ക്വിക്ലി ടോക്ക് അബൌട്ട് ദാറ്റ് ഇൻ ടൂ ത്രീ മിനിറ്റ്സ് ആൻഡ് ക്വിക്ലി ഷിഫ്റ്റ് ടു അബ്സോർട്ട് തിയേറ്റർ സ്പീക്കിംഗ് അബൌട്ട് ടെന്നസി വില്യംസ് ആൻഡ് മെമ്മറി പ്ലേസ് ഇറ്റ്സ് എ വേർഡ് കോയിൻഡ് ബൈ ഹിംസെൽഫ് ഹി യൂസ് വൈറ്റ് സ്ക്രീൻസ് ഹി യൂസ് ടു കോൾ ദാറ്റ് മൈൻഡ് ഹി യൂസ് ടു യൂസ് ലൈറ്റിംഗ്സ് ഡിഫറെന്റ് ലൈറ്റിംഗ്സ് ഫോർ ഡിഫറെന്റ് മൂഡ്സ് യാ റെഡ് ബ്ലൂ ഗ്രീൻ വൈറ്റ് യാ യെല്ലോ Uh, and then there was music to match to the scene and that's how he tried to impress the audience so i'd like to give you a quick demo of what happens in one of his plays you may remember this play if you have done it in kerala you would have learned this play called the glass menagerie and if you studied in mg university or any any affiliated colleges under mg university you would have learned this play in a paper called comparative literature we have this thing called uh, uh, agale a malayalam adaptation by shyam prasad and the, the glass manager so what happens in this is that in agale if you have seen that movie prithviraj comes and lands into a port then somebody i don't remember who that is maybe she she looks like lena so someone like lena uh, welcomes him by now prithviraj is an established writer 
and then they get into a car they board a car and they travel and prithviraj looks at the tall buildings in the city with astonishment and he reflects back at his teenage days so mind you when the novel begin when the play when the movie begins he is a gray haired uh, bulganaka which i have mentioned but uh, by the time the car moves and he looks at the tall buildings the, the the movie takes back to a stage when he was in his late 20s a black bearded man and cinema has a specific technique to show these things which is called flashback which drama lacks in theater there is no flashback so in order to experiment with that tennessee williams had this wonderful concept called memory play due to shortage of time i quickly try to give you a glimpse of how this works you can later go back and look at the textbook okay unfortunately my tube light is not working so please be happy with this light setting i couldn't arrange for anything else but i'm sure i'm visible to all of you i'm just unplugging my headsets and i'm just giving you a, a glimpse of the introductory scene of that play perfect i hope i'm visible to all of you so what happens when the beginning of Tennessee Williams the glass menagerie is that as the play begins we have Tom Wingfield Tom who is the protagonist as i already told you and the play begins he is in his mid late 30s or early 40s by now he is an established screenplay writer in hollywood and he always wanted to be one but 20 years ago when he was a youngster he used to work in a shoe factory his family consider of his mother and a crippled leg sister or a sister with a crippled leg angavaygilliyum ulla oru sahodari and his dad has deserted the family he had run away so when the play begins tom wingsfield comes in front of the stage he addresses the mic he is in a way looking older and he tries to speak to address the audience maybe call it a monologue or call it a conversation interaction whatever you want to the spotlight is on tom there is some music if you if you need like and tom comes to the stage and says hello everyone good evening i'm tom wingfield i'm 45 years old and as of now i am an established screenplay writer in hollywood but 20 years ago this wasn't the case 20 years ago i used to work in a shoe factory and because my father had deserted my family which consisted of my mother then all of a sudden another spotlight goes to the back so behind tom there is a seat where her mother his mother amanda is seated she is teaching agalela the shile ana cheyadu if you remember that movie bayangara over makeup ok ittu bayangara hyperactive aayittu or amma so she is sitting there so there is a spotlight going on to her as she is teaching something and the spotlight is on her there is no movement no dialogue but then she is simply stitching and then tom says that i also had a sister who had a crippled leg and we used to call her blue rose as the disease was called blue roses so immediately another spotlight goes there and there is this young sister by her being a part of the kalaka who is the kind of sister uh, and there is a sad you know music uh, melancholic music playing in the background so then he says because my father had deserted uh, my family and i was the only source of income for the family and uh, uh, because i wanted to be a screenplay writer my mother feared that i would desert the family so slowly tom starts walking and i don't know that so my mother was scared that you know i would desert the family and go away and away too and uh, because i was fed up with my mother's tantrums i used to come late after working in a factory i used to go to movies get drunk and come late uh, in the house uh, when i used to come late my mother used to yell at me in the nadandu parangondirikka appo athra nera avade ee ammi molu irunnu avaru or activities undu nikka so after 45 vayasulla tom wingfield is walking to and fro is walking to and fro and uh, he is saying that when i used to come late my mother used to yell at me all of a sudden amanda wakes up and oh tom you came late today also are you going to leave us like your father did and all of a sudden tom looks back at his uncle and says oh no mama not again not today this is memory play for you this is how tennessee williams blends what may be called flashback in a cinema into theater i'm just giving a demo a glimpse for you 
I'm sorry that I can't give you anything more than that due to our lack of time or time constraints that we have. All right. So let's quickly move on from uh, the one act play. Of course, Glass Menagerie was a two act play, mind you. And another lucrative thing which made Tennessee Williams write these short plays was that he could later convert it into a Hollywood script and mint money from the producers. So Glass Menagerie, for instance, was converted into a movie with the same name. Most of his plays have been converted into cinema. So that's something that you can go back and have a look at. We are quickly taking a leap to the phenomena called the theater of the absurd. I'll try to do a round of it. To be very honest, my intention is to give you an idea of the theater of the absurd. Waiting for Godot can be simply summed up in the subtitle that it has. Nothing happens, nobody comes, nobody goes. Yes, there are certain scenes that needs to be discussed. We'll do as and when we get time. But my focus entirely is on discussing the theater of the absurd in entreaty. It's really fun, you know. The theater of the absurd is really, really, really fun. So we'll do that and uh, very quickly and then we'll move on to uh, the play. And uh, yeah, so as we do that, all right. So while we speak about the concept of absurd or the theater of the absurd, you must also be aware of what may be called as post-war theater. If you go to Krasko's theater, they'll give you a lot of uh, phenomena like Dadaism, Surrealism, then these things come in, then you have uh, theater of cruelty and everything coming after this. So I'm not going to that details. You can go back and have a look at that. But speaking about the theater of the absurd, you must be aware of the post-war theater. I repeat in English, uh, post the two world wars that shook the world and a great depression that fell in between in 1929, the entire world was left hopeless. Whatever people, whatever hopes people nurtured until that point of time was shattered by these two world wars and all the pandemics that was forging through the world. So religion was being challenged. Our day-to-day -day existence and the meaning or the meaninglessness of the life was getting challenged. So under such a pretext, the post-war theater becomes very significant. And when we speak about theater, it's not only about theater, you should also think about novel. Of course, you don't have much in MEG3 to deal with the post-war novels. But then uh, take the case of French novelists like Albert Camus and uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Camus, for instance, wrote a novel called the Stranger, or it's also with another title, The Outsider. The novel The Stranger or The Outsider begins with the statement. Mama died. Mama means mother. Okay. Mother died yesterday or today. I don't remember. I do not remember. I'm on my way to the funeral. I hope you get the point. Mama died. Yesterday or today, I don't remember. I'm on my way to the funeral. In a post-war NUI, in a, in, a, in a chaotic world, in, an ex, in a nihilistic world, another term I would like to make you familiarized with, nihilism. You can go back and uh, maybe have a look at someone like Kafka, Franz Kafka. Yeah? So nihilism pervades and you have this existentialist angst uh, throbbing through and you have a character who says my mother died yesterday or today I have no idea and I'm going for her funeral and in the progress of that novel he kills a stranger without any motive in a beach so such absurdities form the part of what may be called as existential novels existentialism is what came in novels in the post-war NUI. In drama, existentialism paved way to another thing called the absurd. Theater of the absurd. So what is absurd? What is the Malayalam equivalent to absurd? Or if there are any North Indians, what's the Hindi equivalent to absurd? I don't want this to be a lecture. That's why I'm taking that liberty to interact here. What are the equivalents of these words? If you can I remember. don't know. 
ഓ സിംഗിൾ വേർഡ് ഇറ്റ്സ് മോർ ഓർ ലെസ് മലയാളത്തിൽ ഒരു അന്തോം കുന്തോ ഇല്ലാത്ത തന്നെയാണ് ആ അന്തോം കുന്തോം ഇല്ലാത്തതിന് പിന്നെയും ഒരു അന്തോം കുന്തോ ഉണ്ടല്ലോ അതിനേക്കാളും നല്ലൊരു വാക്കുണ്ട് അസംബന്ധം അസംബന്ധം അസംബന്ധ നാടകവേ അസംബന്ധം ഓർ ഇൻ അതർ വേർഡ്സ് ഇൻ ഹിന്ദി വി സേ ബക്വാസ് ബക്വാസ് മീനിങ് ലെസ് ഡസ് മേക്ക് എനി സെൻസ് നോൺ സെൻസിക്കൽ So the theater of the absurd came into existence. Who coined this term? Arkele Vario. The term theater of the absurd was coined by Dash. In fact, that's a problematic term. Who coined the term absurd and who coined the term the theater of the absurd? There are two people in that sense. Doesn't matter. The concept absurd first appears in Albert Camus' essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, in 1942. just in case you haven't read that you can go back and have a look at that whenever you feel like uh, for malayalis it's a bit more simpler myth of sisyphus is identif- identical to uh, the naranathu brandan analogy in malayalam there is this guy or kall uriti 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 malada meli konda chanatta tabe ennum parna thaayikku yeah the one who uh, what do you call it? rolls a stone up the hill and pushes it down claps his hands and is happy isn't that absurd so that is what the myth of sisyphus is all about i'm sure you know this sto- the other story about brandon as well narantha brandon de munbile devi pratyekshapettu devi yochu endu varam venam endu yochal thara i'm really impressed by you and brandon paranju ende valte kallile mandu edathe kallile kaaki tharo yeah so uh, the myth of sisyphus is, is something that is similar to this or identical to this Uh, and uh, he albert camus speaks about the concept of absurd in 1942 but the term the theater of the absurd was used by martin eslin a critic to label the innovative unconventional style of modern plays in an essay that he wrote in the year 1963 titled the theater of the absurd so by then they were playwrights who wrote certain certain sort of plays which could be distinctly identified as the theater of the absurd yeah you spot on aisha it's martin eslin martin eslin wrote an essay called the theater of the absurd in 1963 wherein he spoke about a group of playwrights who wrote in certain ways which were absurdical in itself and these playwrights didn't really agree to it for example beckett never agreed that he is an absurd playwright but nonetheless uh it was popular and uh, some of the major popular dramatists of absurd theater were samuel beckett john genet from france eugene ionesco or ionesco arthur adamo tom stoppard and so on and uh, among the popular plays include john genet's the maids eugene ionesco's the ball soprano and so many which i would come back to in a short while adamo's ping pong tom stoppard's play rosencrantz and guildenstern are dead and uh, so on and uh, the the absurd traitor had a lot of characteristic features like for instance violation of traditional rules of drama lack of coherent story and well made plot fragmented dialogues meaningless cliches or nonsense noises language is a tool of non communication and the language is generally used as a tool of communication but non communication futile actions use of fantasy and black humor often characters are puppet like and helpless victims of blind fate you have bare and desolate settings and fluid and indefinite sequence of time and generally these plays deal with anxiety alienation and so on and uh, uh, this is one of the primary reason why we value uh, plays which are of absurd nature so coming back to our concern let's discuss a little bit about the origin of theater of the absurd which is a bit crucial at this particular point of time as well and before we venture to do that let me just have a look at something okay. so i have a few things to be read out but before i read that out i'd like to share with you a few plays so that you would appreciate the theater of the absurd a little bit more I'd like to share with you a few stories for the next say 20 25 minutes. 
I'll give you the attendance sheet by 6:40, hopefully, or 6:45. But I would like to quickly share with you a few stories regarding the theater of the episode. Am I audible? If somebody can give me a cue, because I've logged in from my mobile now. Can you come with me, Nanda? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. So I'd like to begin our discussions about the theater of the episode. giving you a fictitious story about how it originated i'm saying fictitious because i don't have any proper records but i have heard quite a few of my teachers recounting the story to speak about the inception of the theater of the episode story goes like this in ireland a play was being performed in a when in a small theater where there were very few part of spectators because that was performed by a theater you know a theater student it was an amateur play and because the play was an amateur play there were only a very few people seated in the hall and the play was going on a dull play oh yeah before that i wanted to ask you one more thing what if i i mean because of lack of time i just concluded myself uh, if i ask you what is your idea about theater or concept about theater you may say that it's about a stage where there are characters coming in within the confinement of three walls they'll involve in dialogues and exchanges and they'll walk away this was theater until the theater of the episode began perhaps so uh, it's not about three walls theater is not actually something that happens on stage so what happens in this fictitious play is that when the play begins a murder is committed on stage there is a guy who has been killed by a guy by using a gun or something and he throws that weapon away and the police catches this murderer and they take him to the court the rest of the play is a trial so what happens on the court is this culprit has been put to trial vaada pratiwadangal nadakkum and eventually because the court or because the judge doesn't have Uh, crucial evidences he is about to pronounce his judgment that telivugal dabavathil ee pradiye verde vidunu yeah due to lack of evidences i am setting him free so until then imagine you were in this audience very little very few people though, and you felt bored by this play there is an action in the beginning of the play there is a murder that's been committed but thereafter the play is dull too many legal terminologies too many arguments leading no way you know that this guy killed that guy but then it's leading to no way it's really absurd and then eventually the judge is about to say that uh, i'm going to set him free so you are having a few of your fellow spectators who sharing who share the same feelings with you if you yawn they would have also yawned if you said what the hell is happening they would also be saying oh my god we are wasting our time on the amateur performance so you had someone who seated next to you who's of this opinion that this play is entirely dull and boring and this director should be hanged instead yeah so the judge is about to uh, give us verdict that the culprit is set free because of the lack of evidences and at that moment the person sitting next to you stands up and he he loudly yells that i have something to say any kind of karyam parayan undu so what is it that he has to say nan kandu ende ee rendu kannum kondu i have seen that this guy murdered that guy so then the judge says whatever you have to say you have to come up and say in the court you cannot speak from the audience so this guy walks all the way up to the stage and he confesses or he registers his testament saying that he witnessed the murder and taking into account this spectators eyewitness account the judge changes his decision and uh, pronounces the verdict to hang the culprit koleyali at drikshakshi moriyude balathil thooki kollan judge uttaru imagine you being seated next to the eyewitness and the shock that you had at the thrilling climax of the play so some people say this is where it all began but then there are so many playwrights who have you know flashes of this uh, theatrical skills of theater of the absurd 
I shall come back to them later. But to get started with, there is one playwright that I mentioned a little while ago called John Jenny, J E A N G E N E T. He has written two interesting plays, The Balcony and The Maids. Both are homosexual in nature. John Jenny was himself a homosexual. He was a gigolo, G I G O L O. Gigolo means a male prostitute, and uh, he had. Uh, uh, some soft corner for such people and uh, this play celebrated homosexuality back then when it was a taboo. Alright, so we'll quickly move on to uh, two playwrights and that's what we are going to do and we quickly move on to uh, Waiting for Gogol. But before we do that, these two playwrights are Eugene Ionesco, a French playwright and Samuel Beckett who's Waiting for Gogol we have been prescribed for. But I'm discussing Eugene Ionesco in detail because only then you'll be able to celebrate the absurd. Only then you'll be able to appreciate the absurd theater. So I would try to give you some glimpses of the theater of the absurd, hoping that you'll be able to understand and appreciate what it is. And uh, yep, that's it. So I... All right, let's get started. Those who are yet to... Mark your attendance may do so. Let me begin by reading out a small definition about absurd. I'll do the same again, maybe after the performances is or are over. Yeah. But to get started with as a starting point, let me begin with this definition. What is absurd? Its dictionary meaning is as follows. Against reason or common sense, clearly false or foolish, funny because clearly unsuitable or impossible. Martin Eslin, in the introduction to his book, The Theatre of the Absurd, adds some other adjectives. Out of harmony with reason, or propriety, incongruous, illogical. He continues as follows. In common usage, absurd may simply mean ridiculous. But this is not the sense in which Camus used the word and in which it is used when we speak of the theater of the absurd. In an essay on Kafka, Ionesco defined his understanding of the term as follows. Absurd is that which purpose cut off from his religious metaphysical is devoid of and transcendental roots. Man is lost. All his actions become senseless, absurd, useless. I hope you get what I read. Doesn't matter, even if you don't, we'll come back to it in a very, very short while. And I'm sure you will understand what this means in a much more deeper way. All right? So, speaking about the theater of the absurd, I told you we'll discuss two people from here on. One is Eugene Ionesco, a French playwright. And the other one is Samuel Beckett, or none other than Samuel Beckett. So what, or who is Eugene Ionesco? Eugene Ionesco, as I've already told you, is a French playwright. He has written a lot of plays which come under this category of the theater of the absurd. Now, the question that should, that, should, that should interest you is how absurd are his plays? Or why should you know, someone like Professor Anand Krishnamurti be spending a major portion of his class on Waiting for Godot talking about this from Eugene Ionesco? Yeah? I know that's a problematic space. But then, there is a reason which makes me eloquently speak about Eugene Ionesco. And you would believe me 
the moment i take say 3 to 4 of his place let me begin with the smallest one there is a play written by eugene unesco titled the lesson i repeat the title is the lesson if you are taking down the notes the title is l e s s o n the lesson okay yeah. so what happens in that play is you know no i'm sorry the the, the 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 protagonist is an old man a teacher so this teacher has probably retired from service and now he gives tuition to students and he as a, as a play begins he is waiting at a hotel room for his tuition student to arrive mind you the team is waiting there he is waiting for his student to arrive then the student comes and he starts teaching so just like most of the students the student is least bothered about what this old man is trying to communicate the old man in fact in contrast is really desperate to teach the child he has a lot of woes self doubts and excitement and you know commitment towards a future generation so he tries to bring up his best to seek the attention of the learner you know the teachers do a lot of things to grab your attention but still you may be distracted probably so the student is distracted no matter what strategy he uses she does not really pay any attention to him she yawns and she seems disinterested she does not really give a damn about what he says so what would he do petamnu namukku samayam illa petamnu unmute cheyittu valare aaveshathode class eduthondirikkan na chodyam choycha onnum parayunnilla onnum shraddhikkunnilla bayangara distracted aanu student typical of her what would the teacher do yell he may yell okay what else could he do question yeah beat slap ask question yes he does not pay him he does all these things he does all these things but she does not really show any interest in the old man so fed up because he has been putting in the efforts and she is not listening to him and he seeks that attention he murders a student ayala kutiye konnu kalayu you know don't be scared this is online so you know we cannot do that so feel safe at home even otherwise i am not going to do that don't worry but then he kills he murders a student and then there is a lady who has come for room service cleaning the room she is witness to this murder and silently she helps the teacher to bury the student's corpse under the carpet and the play ends with the teacher waiting for another student to come eda ee shavam marav cheya ee clean cheya vanna lady yara sahayikunnu and he waits for another tuition student to come and knock the door that's how the play ends wait i know what you're going to say wait let's quickly move on to another book another popular play by eugene anesco is titled amedi a m e d i amedi amedi is a story of two couple oh no in fact a couple is two right a husband and a wife a husband and a wife who have been wedded for say 20 years or so but over the last 18 years or so we from the beginning of the play we understand that their marriage is not in harmony in fact it's in disharmony so what is the disharmony all about we see that the protagonist is an aspiring writer nammada kadhaila nayagan oru novelist aavan aagrahikkunna alle oru eluthukaran aavan aagrahikkunna oru aala but over the course of say two decades he has only written two lines only two lines and those two lines are will that be growing and i forgot what the second line is but nonetheless adu valarunnundavu and maybe adinoru deshyam undavu i don't remember what exactly and i avulku ippol line ishtam aayirukku something like that and in the meanwhile as the story progresses we see that the wife of course the story happens in the dining hall of the couple it's a flat 
and uh, there is a bedroom which is not seen in the in the, in the screen uh, or in the stage the wife goes and opens the bedroom door and goes into the bedroom quite a lot of times and the husband chides her saying that you are still obsessed with that room and that man but now we get an insight into what's happening we get hints into the uh, two characters we get the hint that they are not having a great time as a couple together physically because their bedroom is closed it's open only for cleaning so why would it be closed you know we 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 did speak about hamlet's parents in activity sexual in activity so here the bedroom is closed and the wife opens it every now and then to clean that why because the wife had a guy an illicit guy maybe it was just a friend maybe it was beyond that the husband found it out and he murdered that so called jara yeah the illicit and the cops has been kept under the court kattilde adile aa shavam marav cheyiru varshangalai vechikka and the wife replies her husband saying that she is not actually fond of that guy who's dead but over the years she feels that the body is growing you know larger and larger a taller and taller ee kattilde adi karnata shava shariram valarnu kondirikkunu ennu bhariki thonnu appo bhari adu vrittiyaakkanum clean cheyanum ee shariram odichu madaki kattilde adi lekku idanum kudiyanu kadappu muri thorakkunnathu ennu avagashapaduthu whenever the bell rings or whenever something happens they are really shocked and they don't really open the door or they don't really let anybody into their apartment and e or growth is metaphorically as i told you there is speciality and time functioning here s p a t i a l i t t y no space space my word but speciality and time so uh, the time is a bit of a metaphorical thing so is the space so the growing corpse is not need not literally be the corpse growing but the presence of the absent dead person in the marital life between these two couple possible so nonetheless we understand that the corpse is growing and finally the husband agrees to his wife that he will take that corpse out and uh, somehow get rid of it when you and the loga mahayudha nadakkana samayam it's the time of the second world war so it's not easy to walk with the cops you could get arrested and you could get prosecuted but despite that he wants to somehow get rid of this cops so he takes that cops and he walks out midway he happens to meet a soldier and he is scared that he's got caught red handed but to his surprise the soldier offers help to our character to our protagonist to bury the cops ഇത് ശവം മറവ് ചെയ്യാൻ സഹായിക്കാമെന്ന് പട്ടാളക്കാരൻ വാഗ്ദാനം ചെയ്യും ആസ് ബോത്ത് ഓഫ് ദം ട്രൈ ടു ഡു ദാറ്റ് ദ പോലീസ് കം ടു ക്യാച്ച് ദം ആൻഡ് ആസ് ദേ ട്രൈ ടു ക്യാച്ച് അമീദി ഹൂ ഇസ് എ പ്രൊട്ടാഗനിസ്റ്റ് അമീദി ഫ്ലൈസ് ഇൻ ടു ദി എ ആൻഡ് ഹി വാനിഷസ് ഇൻ ടു തിൻ എ ആൻഡ് ദാറ്റ്സ് ഹൗ ദ പ്ലേ എൻഡ്സ് ഐ റിപ്പീറ്റ് ഐ ഹോപ്പ് യു ഗോട്ട് ദ എൻഡിങ് പട്ടാളക്കാരന്റെ കൂടെ ചേർന്ന് തന്റെ ഭാര്യയുടെ ജാരന്റെ ശവശരീരം മറവ് ചെയ്യാൻ നോക്കിക്കൊണ്ടിരിക്കെ ഇദ്ദേഹത്തെ പിടികൂടാനായി നിയമ അധികാരികൾ വരികയും പിടി വീഴാൻ പോകുന്ന മൊമെന്റിൽ അമേരി പറന്ന വായുവിൽ ഉയർന്ന് അപ്രത്യക്ഷനാവുകയും ചെയ്യും ദിസ് ഹൗ ദ പ്ലേ എൻസ് ന വെയ്റ്റ് അഗെയിൻ ദിസ് ഇസ് നോട്ട് ഓവർ ദേ എറ്റ് ലെറ്റ് മീ ക്വിക്ക്ലി ടേക്ക് യു ടു അനദർ പ്ലേ പ്ലീസ് ടൈറ്റിൽ ദ ചെയർസ് സി എച്ച് എ ഐ ആർ എസ് ജസ്റ്റ് ഗിവ് എ സെക്കൻഡ് If you go to POK or Google and download the chairs, this is the page that you would get to. If you can see this, yeah. Already UNESCO has drawn the shape of the stage. And he's given stage directions and a lot of things in the play. So again in Amidhi, sorry, in the chairs, we have two characters. Who are those two characters? a gay couple a husband and a wife this time a fisherman and his wife so what happens in chairs is that you are all spectators this is why i have precisely chosen this subject for the time being i quickly rush through these two plays so you have chosen 
to watch the play you have come to the stage you have been seated in a proscenium manner in a half round half arc manner and when the play begins the husband comes to you and addresses you as and so and so and i'm glad that you all come to this both me and my wife martha we have come across a great secret and don't worry we'll tell you that we have called you all we have assembled you all to tell you a great secret now we are curious aren't you so these two couple they invite the entire people in the land to reveal a secret to them so they tell them come to our residence at 5 o'clock in the evening today and we'll let you know that secret that's a worldly secret which nobody knows so if you come to us we'll tell you that secret so then these two are act between themselves martha and jamani ava ayi to avaliki poi vai madam chai ka chai ka pore ka ready aaki vekka aaru fire ni poi vekka to and they have this enactment between them and uh, the husband declares that it's fine and then it's like a mono act or a bi act which way you call that yeah hi mr douglas varu 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 vaa iki 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 enne to maamasiche vegam a iki iki bari vannille kude ah mrs fernandez varu 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 ta iki martha ya aara vannille kude nokku and they built the stick so there are so many people coming in there are plenty of chairs invisible chairs on the stage and invisible characters on the stage who get seated who make a commotion so the husband will be like oh enna kaali chauti onnu nokki nadanude douglas യൂണിവേഴ്സൽ building upon these guests giving them tea giving them biscuits or whatever they want and uh, by the time it's 30 to 40 minutes who start getting impatient akshamara irikkaare evda as audience yes yes it's you you are the audience you are actually the people who have come to listen to our pronouncement of what the universal truth is and then in between he says please be patient with me i know you are getting restless nisha i know you want to know that but please bear with me i'll tell you that universal secret i'll definitely tell you they keep and acting like this and after a while the husband comes and tells you that you know we are an old couple and we are not actually bold enough to reveal that secret to you അപ്പൊ ഇത് കേൾക്കുമ്പോൾ നിൽക്കുന്ന തോന്നും കലി തോന്നും ഒരു മണിക്കൂർ കളഞ്ഞിട്ട് ഈ കടവൻ ഇങ്ങനെയാണല്ലോ പറയണേ തോന്നും ഞങ്ങളുടെ വക്കീൽ Do you think I should say that? And Martha would be like, "Oh, man, I don't think you should do so." Anyway, our vakil is coming, no, our advocate is coming, no, and so on, and they'll build on like that. And then he'll be like, "Ha, here he comes!" So between the audience, from the audience, the advocate makes his entry. He is dressed in that black and white attire. He's got a cap. He's got everything. He's got a big file. He's got a bag in his hands. he walks majestically through you know he walks majestically through the audience he walks and then martha and the husband says okay gentlemen ladies and gentlemen please bid us adieu hinting that they are going to commit suicide so bid us adieu we are taking leave he'll tell you everything thank you so much for being here and being uh, accepting our host today thank you so much goodbye and they quickly move out of the stage and mind you at this point you're least bothered about that you don't give a damn even if they go and commit suicide this guy with it when he comes on stage there's a mic he tries adjusting himself and, <coughs> and he opens he takes he, he takes time again 
he takes the file he takes the bag he takes the file he takes he keeps it back he takes another file then he puts it he looks at it then he keeps it and by the time anybody in the audience would yell up unna parne to lekada pa and uh, by then he will give a puzzled look and say ma ma you know i can't speak or hear enike nem badrenum munganum aanu enike i can't do anything and draws the curtain you may definitely ask at least at this point of time endha sambandham aanu idu adhe asambandham aanu the theater of the absurd welcome and this is not over i have one more one more very interesting story for you maybe i'll wrap it up in 5 minutes very quickly and then i'll move on to uh, samuel beckett's waiting for godo very quickly so what happens with rhinoceros of eugene unesco when the play opens especially malayalis for instance you can if you are from kerala ernakulam you can imagine a busy mg road street they are busing mg road street so anganta mg road la oru bayangara terakkulla oru teruvil there is a cafeteria there is a coffee shop and our lead character our protagonist whose name is berenga b e r e n g e r and his friend dream j e a n berenga and dream are seated like this face to face sipping a glass of coffee or tea or whatever they feel like they are having coffee and the busy mg road street is behind and all of a sudden as these two are sipping and these people are bank employees mind you they are from a bank and they are the races and they are having their cup of coffee and they are having some free time and while they are trying to have that the other people in the cafe are making exclamatory sounds exclamatory sounds like wow hi are wa and they are making exclamation sounds and jean is seated in another road engi tirinja irikku so jean all of a sudden looks back what's it and what's going on is a rhinoceros is crossing a busy road just imagine a tiger crossing a busy road in mg road a natural a to be supposed to be immediate response should have been ayyo idan da ivide right but nobody says that ayyo in the beginning everybody is surprised to see a rhino on a busy street they are like wow hi oh a rhino wow they are excited to see a rhino on the road in its first appearance well before i start the story there was a disclaimer i forgot to mention resemblances to any people living or dead in the modern era is simply fictitious and i have no role in that resemblance ജീവിച്ചിരിക്കുന്നവരോ മരിച്ചവരും മരിച്ചവരുമോ ആയി എന്തെങ്കിലും ബന്ധം ഈ കഥയ്ക്ക് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് തോന്നുന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അത് തികച്ചും സാങ്കല്പികം മാത്രമാണ് എനിക്കതിൽ യാതൊരു റോളും ഇല്ല ഓക്കെ സോ സ്പീക്കിംഗ് അബൌട്ട് ഫസ്റ്റ് അപ്പിയറൻസ് ഓഫ് ദ റൈനോ ദ റൈനോ സാംലെസ് ഇറ്റ് ക്രോസ് ദ റോഡ് ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് വോക്സ് ദ നെക്സ്റ്റ് ടൈം ഇറ്റ് അപ്പിയേഴ്സ് ഇറ്റ് സ്റ്റാംസ് എ കാറ്റ് ഓഫ് എ ലേഡി ആൻഡ് കാറ്റ് ഇസ് ഇൻജേർഡ് സബ്സിക്വന്റ് അപ്പിയറൻസസ് are in packs ottekku vanna rhino randum moonu vai vanna kootam kootam vai varan thodum the city becomes flooded with rhinos and anybody who gets in contact with the contact with the rhino turns into a rhino there is this disease that spreads over the world like corona called rhinoceros rhinocerositis okay forgive me if i am wrong because that spelling always confuses me rhinocerositis yeah so everybody gets affected by this anybody who comes in contact with the rhino becomes a rhino ideology you know fascism rise of fascism hitler well no new linkages let's keep it there so uh, with every arrival the rhinos become more and more violent they become more and more dictatorial they become more and more organized and the popular perception also keeps changing the first time when the rhino is seen in that you know while having that coffee uh, when they report in the bank there is this manager who is like a journalist he he dismisses this he rubbishes this he says engine road nadakku patta pagal kaduvayo podu chumma eh chumma podu varayilla podu second time third time the tone slowly changes then all of a sudden from dismissing it as a hypothetical bluffing it turns into 
if a rhino is seen in the middle of a busy road, then we have to be careful. Rhinos are a threat to human beings. Mind you, rhinos are a threat to human beings, our life and property. As the play moves on, as I told you, more and more people coming into contact with rhino becomes rhinos. Saffron in color, mind you. Well, <laughs> so they turn into rhinos and uh, the tone changes. Well, what's it in being a rhino? What's wrong with rhino? Rhinos, what's wrong with being? Rhino, I have to Rhino, I have to Well, Adi, rhino, I have to Rhino. I mean, Adi, Pudu, I have to tell you. Rhino, I have to tell you. Rhino, I have to tell you. Rhino, I have then slowly it changes. Rhino is not in India. Rhino thing is what we need. Then it quickly changes to other others changes. It's like, what's wrong with rhino? Look at the tusk of the rhino. Isn't that beautiful? So it goes on to such narrations. And uh, in the meanwhile, there are a lot of wonderful, absurd things happening. For instance, one fine day, there's a colleague of Berenger and Jean, a lady, whose husband is missing. And Ravel Tutta Street, Bangi, on the Karchilo to Karchila. My husband is missing, my husband is missing, the Bernie, Engela. And all of a sudden, there's a tremor, there's a shake in the building. So now everybody go out to see what it is, earthquake, everybody goes out and has a look. And downstairs, there's her husband, who has turned into a rhino. He's in a scooter, he's calling for her. Rangi Vadi! Mole! In the Marthuli camp. The moment she sees her husband, her heart leaps out of joy and she jumps from the top, joins him in the scooter and rides away with her, thereby becoming a rhinoceros. So all of a sudden, the city is completely becoming filled by rhinoceros. And where do rhinoceros try to capture? All the common places. Statues, parks, churches. You see the irony, don't you? Yeah, the, all, the, all the public places uh, confiscated by the rhinos and destroyed or taken hold of. And uh, one fine day, Jean, who was having coffee with Beranga in the opening scene, doesn't come to the office. And Beranga goes in search of Jean. And what happens? Jean goes to, sorry, Beranga goes to Jean's room. He knocks it and he sees a Jean. He's, you know, lying down. So Beranga goes to him and asks him, what's wrong with you? Why are you lying? Are you not well? Are you having fever? And then Jean opens it and says, am I okay? Do I have a horn here? And then Beranga dismisses it. And then all of a sudden, as Beranga sees his friend, when he's lying down, all of a sudden, as he stands up and he asks, Are you sure there is no harm here? And as he tries to speak, his speech changes. Are you, are you sure? He tries to hit Berenga with that horn. Berenga walks out with impending fear. So, in the process, Jean also transforms into a rhinoceros. Now, what is left? That's the fantastic part of the play. Only two characters are left at the end of the play. One is Beranga, and the other is his lady love, Daisy. Daisy, Beranga, and Matra stage learned. And uh, out of desperation, or I mean, Daisy, pretty yes, Sunum Barnadilla, another context, she hasn't said yes to him. So uh, Beranga tries desperately to convince her to love her. Love him. And you know, it couldn't be any more romantic than this. He building in a port, parker, arkan, elam, rhinoceros, kayari, kanu, atam, partam, akramam, kathikil. You remember that fort, right? So a lot of issues have happened. So um, there's plenty of chaos in the street. And only two people are left, and that's Beranga and Daisy. And Beranga talks to Daisy in the most romantic way. What does he say? Oh, Daisy. Let whoever wanna go go. In order to ensure the recuperation of humankind, you know, 
മാനവരാശിയുടെ പുനരുദ്ധാരണം എന്ന് മറ്റേ In order to, the, uh, to ensure the recuperation of the humankind, only two things are required. And that two things, one aal, nyanam, one penna, neem. You know, prathul paadu me. So only two things are required. A guy, that means, nyanam da lo. A girl, that's you. So if you agree, ondu manasu vachal, pade umar style, ondu manasu vachal. Apre, even Daisy is so distracted, just like the student in the lesson. So Daisy is looking outside and she is looking at the rainbows and she's like, hey, what are you doing? They are like, hi, they can't talk to them. In the rest of the Kumbu Garan, can't talk to them, they are like, this is not good. And Barangar is desperately trying to express his love. What are you doing? 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 Daisy? See, Manavarashi is a little bit of a snail. And then, and then, and then, and then, he's so romantic, desperately. And Daisy is like, go to hell, man. Uh, look at their dances. I just love them. I want to be a rival because I'm going. But, and Daisy leaves the stage. By the time the play reaches its end, there is only one character left. That's Berenger. If you go to BOK and download Rhinoceros, there is a two page monologue that comprises the ending of the play the last line of the play is i am not capitulating capitulating means nyan kiradangan uddeshikkunnilla nyan manushanai thanne chattoda i'm not going to die as a rhino i'll die as a human i don't care but if you watch this play the last two minutes is only about monoad <laughs> You didn't hear a word, did you? Why? Other than that, end the page of dialogue, you can take up it. Communication with silence. All right, look. Dialogue under the page of dialogue, you can take up it. But you can take up it. 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 communication is possible only when or language is permitted only when two people know it ivada berangar mathrame manushanai ullu maashe ningal ellam ganda mrugangala ningalku enda bhasha manasilavilla that's you gene in a score for you the entire people watching are accused to be rhinoceros and the only human being when the entire europe was put into concentration camps by hitler there were plenty of people who promoted it by their sheer stupid silence that silence is rhino societic that's what ionesco tried to point you can draw a lot of similar parallels rhino was who poses photos for selfies rhinoceros who has their face everywhere even when say a rhinoceros wins a gold medal in olympics it's the rhino's face that comes in right a lot of parallels to be drawn well let's not go there so this is how rhinoceros ends there is speech in writing but there is no speech in actual because you're all rhinos this is the peak of absurdity my dears my darlings this is the peak height of absurdity he height in nittana ionesco namale mesmerizing from that vantage point if you go to beckett all that you can do is vomit i repeat he height in nittu ionesco ede naadangalile asambandham kanda andaalichu ninnittu ningal samuel beckettine vaaikkan janna മനം പരട്ടിയിട്ട് ഓക്കാനും വരും ഛർദിക്കാൻ വരും ഓക്കെ
I'm going to share a video with you. And that's how quickly I can end that play. Say, for instance, in five minutes. And because of the performance, I'm really feeling an urge to have some water. So I can take that water break too in the meanwhile. I'm sharing my screen with you. I'm going to share you the tale of waiting for Godu. If at all, there is a story in that. A shabby man named Estragon sits near a tree at dusk and struggles to remove his boot. He's soon joined by his friend Vladimir, who reminds his anxious companion that they must wait here for someone called Godo. So begins a vexing cycle in which the two debate when Godo will come, why they're waiting, and whether they're even at the right tree. From here, waiting for Godo only gets stranger, but it's considered a play that changed the face of modern drama. Written by Samuel Beckett between 1949 and 1955, it offers a simple but stirring question. What should the characters do? Don't let's do anything. It's safer. Let's wait and see what he says. Who? Godo. Good idea. Such cryptic dialogue and circular reasoning are key features of the theater of the absurd, a movement which emerged after the Second World War and found artists struggling to find meaning in devastation. The absurdists deconstructed plot, character, and language to question their meaning and share their profound uncertainty on stage. While this may sound grim, the absurd blends its hopelessness with humor. This is reflected in Beckett's unique approach to genre in Waiting for Godot, which he branded a tragic comedy in two acts. Tragically, the characters are locked in an existential conundrum. They wait in vain for an unknown figure to give them a sense of purpose, but their only sense of purpose comes from the act of waiting. While they wait, they sink into boredom, express religious dread, and contemplate suicide. But comically, there is a jagged humor to their predicament, which comes across in their language and movements. Their interactions are filled with bizarre wordplay, repetition, and double entendre, as well as physical clowning, singing, and dancing, and frantically swapping their hats. It's often unclear whether the audience is supposed to laugh or cry, or whether Beckett saw any difference between the two. Born in Dublin, Beckett studied English, French, and Italian before moving to Paris, where he spent most of his life writing theater, poetry, and prose. While Beckett had a lifelong love of language, he also made space for silence by incorporating gaps, pauses, and moments of emptiness into his work. This was a key feature of his trademark uneven tempo and black humor, which became popular throughout the theater of the absurd. He also cultivated a mysterious persona and refused to confirm or deny any speculations about the meaning of his work. This kept audiences guessing, increasing their fascination with his surreal worlds and enigmatic characters. The lack of any clear meaning makes Godot endlessly open to interpretation. Critics have offered countless readings of the play, resulting in a cycle of ambiguity and speculation that mirrors the plot of the drama itself. It's been read as an allegory of the Cold War, the French Resistance, and Britain's colonization of Ireland. The dynamic of the two protagonists has also sparked intense debate. They've been read as survivors of the apocalypse, an aging couple, two impotent friends, and even as personifications of Freud's ego and id. Famously, Beckett said the only thing he could be sure of was that Vladimir and Estragon were wearing bowler hats. Like the critical speculation and maddening plot, their language often goes in circles as the two bicker and banter, lose their train of thought, and pick up right where they left off. We could start all over again, perhaps. That should be easy. It's the start that's difficult. But you can start from anything. Yes, but you have to decide. Beckett reminds us that just like our daily lives, the world on stage doesn't always make sense. 
It can explore both reality and illusion, the familiar and the strange. And although a tidy narrative still appeals, the best theatre keeps us thinking and waiting. While we have you, why not plunge into an existential vortex? All right, that's as simple as waiting for Ogodo is for you. It's about two tramps. There's a two act play. In the first act and the second act, they both wait for a so called hypothetical Godo who never comes. So, who is Godo? It's a question mark. It has been debated long. There are people who said it's God, there are people who said it's someone else. Beckett has dismissed the possibility of a God, it's not even Christ. But nonetheless, from an examination point of view, a oh, good thing is that you only need to learn four names. Vladimir, Estragon, and then there is Lucky and Pozo. The four names is all that you have to study in relation to this play. And there is nothing to write, as the subtitle suggests. Nothing happens, nobody comes, nobody goes. But within this inaction, Beckett has infused a lot of things. There are people who search for meanings, like we do in Hamlet. Yeah? There are a lot of absurdities that fills the play. Very quickly, I'm going to take your attention to one aspect of the play and we are going to wind up for today. I'm not sure we'll get time for Q&A. We'll do that tomorrow because we'll get plenty of time after a look back in anger and the annotation. So we'll get time tomorrow. So I'd like to show you one more thing and then we'll wind up for the day. That one more thing is lucky speech. You will have a short note sometimes uh, for uh, about lucky speech. So what is lucky speech all about? Lucky speech is uh, there is the stage where this luck, there is this slave like lucky being carried by Pozo. Later it's reversed in second act, and the lucky is asked to speak in the first act like a slave. He's asked to speak, and uh, lucky speaks in a um, in a what do you call a gibberish language. At one glance you would feel there is no meaning to it. Is there a meaning? We'll figure out. Let's have a quick look at Lucky's speech and uh, we'll quickly come back in a minute, perhaps. Just give me a second. Let me figure out where this video, yeah, it's here. No, not here. Lucky's speech, oh yeah, I've got it. So let me share the link, no, not share the link, share the screen with you and uh, play that speech for you. Please pay attention. I will also enable the caption for you. Subtitles. Stop. Think. On the other hand, with regard to... Stop. Back. Stop. Think. Given... The existence the speech begins as uttered forth in the public works of Puncher and Watman of a personal God Qua 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 with white beard Qua 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 Outside time without extension Who from the heights of divine Apathia Divine Athambia Divine Athia, loves us dearly with some exceptions for reasons unknown but time will tell and suffers like the divine miranda with those who for reasons unknown but time will tell are plunged in torment plunged in fire whose fire flames if that continues and who can doubt it will fire the firmament that is to say blast hell to so blue, still, and calm. So calm with a calm which, even though intermittent, is better than nothing, but not so fast. And considering what is more, that as a result of the labors left unfinished, crowned by 
Academy of Anthropopometry of Essie and Posse of Test and Cunard. It is established beyond all doubt, all other doubt than that which clings to the labors of men, that as a result of the labors unfinished of Test and Cunard, it is established as hereinafter, but not so fast, for reasons unknown, that as a result of the public works of Puncher and Watman, it is established beyond all doubt that in view of the labors of Fartov and Belcher left unfinished for reasons unknown, of Testu and Cunard left unfinished, it is established what many deny, that man and posse of Testu and Cunard, that man and Essie, that man and Short, that man and Brief, in spite of the strides of alimentation and defecation, is seen to waste and pine. Waste and pine, and concurrently, simultaneously, what is more, for reasons unknown, in spite of the strides of physical culture, the practice of sports such as tennis, football, running, cycling, swimming, flying, floating, riding, gliding, conating, camogie, skating, tennis of all kinds, dying, flying, sports of all sorts, autumn, summer, winter, winter, tennis of all kinds, hockey of all sorts, penicillin and succedania, in the word I resume, and concurrently, simultaneously, for reasons unknown, to shrink and dwindle. In spite of the tennis, I resume flying, gliding, golf over nine and eighteen holes, tennis of all sorts, in a word, for reasons unknown in Thackham, Thackham, Fulham, Clown. Currently, simultaneously, what is more for reasons unknown, but time will tell, to shrink and dwindle. I resume, Fulham, Clapham, in a word, the dead loss per capita since the death of Bishop Barclay, being to the tune of one inch, four ounce per capita, approximately, by and large, more or less, to the nearest decimal, good measure, round figure, stark naked in the stocking, feet in Connemara, in a word, for reasons unknown, no matter what matter, the facts are there. And considering what is more, much more grave, than the light of the labours lost of Steinweg and Peterman, it appears what is more, much more grave, than in the light, the light, the light of the labours lost of Steinweg and Peterman, that in the plains, in the mountains, by the seas, by the rivers, running water, running fire, the air is the same, and then the earth, namely the air, and then the earth, and the great cold, the great dark, the air and the earth, abode of stones, and the great cold, alas, alas, in the year of the Lord, six hundred and something, the air, the earth, the sea, the earth, abode of stones, and the great cold, the great deeps, on sea, on land, and in the air, I resume, for reasons unknown, in spite of the tennis, the facts are there, but time will tell, I resume, alas, alas, on, on, in short, in fine, on, on, the boat of stones, who can doubt it, I resume, but not so fast, I resume, this culture shrink and waste, I can count simultaneously what is more for reasons unknown in spite of the tennis on on the beard the flames the tears the stones so blue so calm alas alas on on the skull the skull the skull the skull in Connemara in spite of the tennis the labors abandoned left unfinished grave are still a boat of stones in a way I resume alas alas abandoned unfinished the skull the skull in Connemara in spite of the tennis the skull alas the stones cunard tennis the stones so cunard unfinished Avenged! Give me that! Even if you don't know what you're talking about, you can tell me all about it. I'll try to make some sense. Even though that's absurd, I agree. I'll try to make some sense into your confusion. Just give me another second. I'll share the screen with you. Just give me a second. This would give you a better testament. No explanation, but just a look into the absurd speech. Give one. Okay, I wanted to enact this, but then I am not sure I'm fully prepared for that, but I'll try to give it a go. This day really seems to be good. So far, so good. Unplanned and hence good. So let me give this a try then. Given, where is that? Yep. Yeah. Given the existence as a third fourth in the public works of Pacha and Watman of personal God with outside time, without extension, who from the heights of divine loves us dearly with some exceptions for reasons unknown, but time will tell and suffers like the divine. And that, that, that makes sense when you go through everything. I've shared the wrong page here. Okay, just give me a second. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I hope the screen is visible to you. Yeah. Given the existence of a personal God who exists outside of time and who loves us dearly and who suffers with those who are plunged in torment, it is established beyond all doubt that man, that man, for reasons unknown, for reasons unknown, our labors abandoned, left unfinished, abandoned, unfinished. So it has a sense but then it's it's uh, bathed with complete nonsense by Beckett. So these are a couple of things that I wanted your attention to go to. 
for the rest you can go back and read the study materials uh, I admit that we couldn't deal much in terms of the plot or the summary, but I try to give you an essence of the absurd. I assume, and uh, you can go back to the blogs. And if you have doubts, if there are certain areas that you think I need to explain a bit more elaborately, you can ask me to do that tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll have time. I think by seven seven fifteen we'll definitely end our discussions tomorrow. So you will have time. And uh, before we wind up, I have one more reading to do. But before we do that. i'd like to share a few links with you as usual first of all the video dealing with waiting for godo in short then you have another interesting video on conversations then the full play of waiting for godo not the best of the best but then something that just like we say kaam chala lena yeah that will do for the bare minimal requisites and uh, as you may have noticed due to the lack of time i couldn't deal deep with samuel beckett's most of the plays i did del- deal with eugene ernesco if you are a malayali and you want to have a look at amedi here is a voice clip that i had rendered myself if you want to have a look at it it's in sound cloud amedi de or a voice rendering thing and uh, because i haven't spoken much about beckett and this other plays i'm sharing an adaptation here again malayalam but subtitles are available craps last tape is the name of the play uh, the malayalam adaptation of crapum kurupu and dr vc harris who's no longer with us one of the legendary teachers from school of letters mg university kottayam has played one of the lead roles in that in that adaptation all right so before i wind up we have 3 minutes to do that so before i wind up i'd like to read what i read at 6:35 and uh, for those who are taking notes may take note from this as a concluding part what is absurd its dictionary meaning is as follows against reason or common sense mind you common sense is not so common clearly false or foolish funny because clearly unsuitable or impossible again i missed out another play you can go back and refer in be okay while searching for rhinoceros the world is all but eggs or the world ends in eggs by ionesco in that from the photograph the dead grandfather comes out and dances and sings and there is a lot of funny things happening you can look at that later okay so yeah uh, funny or clearly uns- because clearly unsuitable and impossible martin hislin in his introduction to the book the theater of the absurd at some other abje- adjectives out of harmony with reason or propriety incongruous illogical he continues as follows in common usage absurd may simply mean ridiculous but this is not the sense in which camu used the word in myth of sisyphus and in which it is used when we speak of the theater of the absurd in an essay on kafka ionesco defined his understanding of the term as follows absurd is that which purpose cut off from his religious metaphysical is devoid of and transcendental roots man is lost in godo you can see that didi and gogo are lost they have no idea of time frame they have no idea of what's happening no logic whatsoever man is lost all his actions become senseless absurd useless take the case of beranga all the actions become useless senseless absurd Ionesco once defined the absurd as anti-idea, and for this reason, some call his theater anti-theater. Ionesco's definition, quoted by Eslin, reveals a metaphysical anguish at the incongruity, uselessness, and senselessness of the human condition. नम्रे मानुषिक जीवन तिंडे निष्फलदा निरार्थकदा means like English ही मात्रा नहीं है incongruity मालियार्थी पर नहीं बरसना Okay. but to keep in simple word meaninglessness of the world or the life that we live we are born and we have to suffer and we know we'll die but we'll but still we keep living that's the essence of it okay in simple words and i would also like to read these three lines and call it off this new theater may be called the theater as ritual i'm taking you back to greek ritualistic drama come back to absurd theater this new theater may be called the theater as the ritual which necessarily seeks a collective experience because in ritual everyone participates 
participatory theater that's why audience in the bolu alkar kari stage like veru everyone participates but it's mainly called as the theater of the absurd a term which was first used for the production of ian scores the bal soprano in paris in 1950 the theater of the absurd is an expression of individual vision the spectator may experience that vision too but what matters is the artist expression of his vision and mind you uh, waiting for godwan absurd nu parney logam mottam thalli kalaiyumbulum meaningless nu parayumbulum ee naadagathil artham kandathi oru kootru undu aranariyo in 1963 i guess this play was staged in a prison and the prisoners could easily relate to their day to day life with god i mean waiting for god so it's not meaningless purely yep so on that note let me conclude the session apologies for not giving the q and a time but surely we'll make out for that make up for that tomorrow i would like to thank you all from the bottom of my heart because today was such a ritualistic day for me theater is a purifying cleansing endeavor ever since we've gone to this online mode as a teacher who loved to teach by acting mg2 british drama offline i have always felt crippled but somehow i was really excited as the day progressed today i i thank you because you were there in numbers there were 45 to get started with and there are 41 to get ended with it's my pleasure and trust me the numbers matter so thank you so much for thank you so much guys for being here with these words i resign see you tomorrow mind you tomorrow is our last day so please don't ask me for another extension of your annotation and essays come with that we'll discuss that in the second half in the first half we'll look back in anger and then we'll call it a day to mg2 thank you so much guys thank you so much for your patience thank you so much see you tomorrow peace and good night